Is TJ Hawkinson busting out as a free agency signing? Is Kevin O'Connell on the hot seat? Would I trade a draft pick for Justin Fields? That and all the rest of your burning questions on Twitter Tuesday on the Locked On Vikings podcast. You liked it on three, one, two, three. You, like it! you are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where we try to learn something new every single day. I'm your host, Luke Braun. You can find this show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, whether it is any audio platform, including the SiriusXM app, where you can also find uh, live streams of all the games, live broadcasts. You can listen to them on SiriusXM radio or any uh, trials or uh packages you can also find the show on youtube or amazon fire and roku just download the locked on minnesota sports app thanks so much for listening to this show every single day and for those of you who make it your first listen of the day every day my hashtag every day i appreciate you greatly today's episode is brought to you by game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on nfl for 20 dollars off of your first purchase last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed Today's episode is Twitter Tuesday. That means I'm taking your questions, a whole bunch, a lot of them relating to the Chiefs game, some about where we go from here, and some stuff that is just crazy and off the wall, which is kind of my favorite. <laughs> but I will start today, by the way, if you do have a question, you can always send it to me at Luke Brown NFL or at Locked on Vikings on Twitter. No question is too basic. No stupid questions are possible. Send me whatever is on your mind. Uh, the first one comes, oh, you can also, also leave a YouTube comment or send an email to lockdownvikingspodcast at gmail.com or, uh, send a, or if you can fill out the show notes, you can also send an email to lockdownvikingspodcast at gmail.com. You can fill out the Google form in the show notes, or you can, uh, just leave a YouTube comment. I'll leave, I'll, uh, read that and maybe even just respond right to it. Uh, first one I'm going to do comes from Bradley Knorr, who says, how are Hawkinson and Josh Oliver doing? Feels like Hawkinson's been a bit lackluster and I don't know how to evaluate Josh Oliver. So I got about 300 versions of this. <laughs> it's just what, what's up with Hawkinson? Why can't he catch? Is he, was he a bad signing? Should Quasi be dragged over the coals and, uh, doused in battery acid for, for signing TJ Hawkinson and, and various overreactions? Uh, the, so here's what I'll say about TJ Hawkinson. I don't think it's incorrect to critique him for not making a, a few of those select catches. You probably have them in mind. Uh, I, that's yeah, he should catch those balls and it's fair to say, all right, those are bad plays. Uh, but if we're going to have do a holistic analysis of whether or not TJ Hawkinson is like worth the contract, it has to be holistic. Right. And I think because of the way our brains are wired, this is like a human psychology thing. Uh, we have negativity bias. It is just better for our brains to think of what could go wrong so that we can be preventative about it than it is to like holistically analyze to holistically analyze things. So we have to sort of try to fight that bias in our own brains about it, right? Um TJ Hawkinson made a whole bunch of really good plays in that Chiefs game. They're just harder to remember uh because they weren't maybe in as pivotal of moments as the the failed completions. I'm not going to call them drops because they were hard enough and contested enough where most places won't chart that as a drop. Um, a failed completion is the term that I use. Uh, so if we want to do that, I think the most important thing to understand is TJ Hawkinson is the go-to guy right now, especially if Jefferson's out, which no word on his hamstring, uh, today, nothing further than what we knew already. Kevin O'Connell said that they they hadn't gotten the MRI results as of like the press conference he did and that they'll get a few different opinions on it. Um, we'll see where, where it's at, but the offense, like in clutch situations, they are more than willing to design play or to, to call plays that are designed to go to TJ Hawkinson, whether that's why choice um, choice is a five yard option route. And it is going to be the first read on just about every time it's called choice is a staple of the Kevin O'Connell offense of the McVay offense that Kevin O'Connell runs choice is a cornerstone concept. And when it is called, it's the first thing. So when it's third and four and they go wide choice, that is basically saying, all right, TJ, we need you on this one. And they have converted a bunch of third and mediums on that this year. Uh, also plays like flag 
uh, where you have a corner with a return. That's flag. TJ Hawkinson will run both the corner and the return. So you can run those things out of, say, a two-man stack and not know which guy's running which, which isn't really true of other tight ends, and that can cause really difficult matchup problems, right? Do you put a linebacker on that stack? What if the linebacker accidentally ends up on the wrong guy? Do you put a corner on him? What if that corner is too small? That's how you can kind of generate those mismatches. Um, there are middle searches. There are... Uh, like deeper option things. There are basics over the middle. They use TJ Hawkinson like a wide receiver, but he also can block like a tight end, right? I won't say like an O-lineman, but like a tight end. And he's got a lot of really, really good blocks in this game. I'm actually working on a Patreon video about TJ Hawkinson. So don't let the plays that stick out become the only plays. I guess that would be the, the thing I would say about TJ Hawkinson. And I think he's doing... There's critiques. I, I wish I want him to do better, uh, but I don't think it's bad enough to start saying it was like a bad signing or anything. I, I think he's still very much one of the best tight ends in the league. Uh, and in terms of Josh Oliver, rough day <laughs> against Kansas City. Got the fumble, had a drop late in the game. Um, absolute God tier blocker. Getting what we were, what we paid for there, big time for sure. Uh, if you go to Josh Cohen's Twitter, I forget the actual handle, but I'm sure you can look it up. Uh, and search it for Josh Oliver. You can see a cut-up of him against Carolina. Absolutely beasting. Kalen H. asks, what is going on with Lewis Seen and Andrew Booth? Just not good enough to crack the lineup or something else. Uh, pretty much, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, as for Lewis Seen, he's stuck behind Theo Jackson on the depth chart, of course. That's not a great sign. He's also hurt right now, so he's been in inactive for the last couple of games. Um, they are. Kevin O'Connell said that he was going to be back this week. Uh, or that they hoped he would be back this week. But, you know, as with all things, got to see it actually happen. And then with Andrew Booth, he's the fourth corner on the roster. So if Caleb Evans is out for any extended period of time, he's got a knee thing. That's another thing we got to watch over the week. Andrew Booth would be the third corner that would come in in nickel sets, play outside, and then you'd either have Blackman or Byron Murphy go into the slot. Um, th that's just where they are on the depth chart. And you can be as disappointed as you want about that. Uh, Arlie G13 asks, why was Mullins inactive this game instead of Hall? Uh, I didn't hear he was injured. So he was injured, and that's actually a little bit of news from the day. Uh, Nick Mullins is has a back thing, and Kevin O'Connell said they're considering a roster move, which sounds like IR to me. So Nick Mullins might be out for a good amount of time, making Jaron Hall the primary backup. So if Kirk Cousins does uh, experience any issues during this next few weeks, we it, it could be Jaron Hall something to be aware of. TJ Martinez says, with JJ potentially being out, Addison will be on the field more and more and possibly targeted more. Is this a g the game where KOC has to take a good look at who should really be wide receiver to between Addison and Osborne? Um, I, I don't know if it's... Like, that evaluation has probably already happened. Like, they, I think they already understand what they have in Addison and what they have in Osborne and what they want to ask of either of those guys uh, with Justin Jefferson out. I think what we will see is in terms of, like, who's the first read... Or who is like the featured guy on concepts, like who does the choice, right? I think we're going to see a lot more wide choice. I think this thing's going to run through Hawkinson a lot more. Uh, and I think this thing's going to run through Jordan Addison a lot more. And KJ Osborne will continue to be the kind of second, third guy in progressions and be available for whatever he is available for. Um, yeah, I, I think it is like maybe this is a week where we see where they are at, right? Maybe that's more of what you're asking. Um and if if Addison is like the first guy in the read a whole bunch, which is kind of how it worked at the end of the game with Jefferson out, there was a lot more Addison in the, at the front of the progression than KJ. Uh, if that continues, then yeah, we kind of have our answer. Skull Squatch says, why can't we get a freaking play call in at home? Uh, should we do, I imagine it's exactly how you said it. <laughs> should we do what college teams do and hold up signs of Fabio and the Geico lizard to get the calls to Kirk? <laughs> Uh, yeah, man. I don't know. Do what you got to do, right? I don't get it. Uh, <laughs> look, I, I think it's just unacceptable to not have. I mean, that technology is wonky, right? It's like wireless Bluetooth across a big stadium like that. That is a difficult technology to get to work properly. But like, oh, my God, get a walkie talkie from the 90s if you have to <laughs> Like, go to Radio Shack. Can't be that hard. Uh, so I, I think it's just something that we have to say like, well, yeah, that that's actually just an unacceptable thing and the, the organization needs to fix it. I have a whole bunch more questions to get to, and I want to make sure I get to them in square time. So 
we will uh, turbocharge this thing coming up. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. If you have ever had a frustrating ticket buying experience, you might want to check Game Time out. Tickets, buying tickets last minute, especially. I, I have tickets to the Raiders game this year, and we were talking about that in like August, and it was still like tough to get those. It is such a nightmare to get football tickets, but Game Time can help you get some, even if you just have the spontaneous ideas. Like, hey, you want to go to a Vikings game this weekend? Check out Game Time. They've got all kinds of flash deals, all kinds of last minute tickets. You can look at uh, pictures of your view so that you can know that you're getting a seat that you like and getting a view that you're satisfied with. And they have the Game Time guarantee, which means if you find the same section and same row somewhere else for less, if you can get a the same tickets for less money, basically, you get 110% of your money back. They will actually give you mon more money back in the refund for your trouble. They're that confident that it's the best deal that you can find. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for 20 bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code L O C K E D O N N F L for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thanks so much for making Lockdown Vikings your first listen of the day each and every day. We're moving on with this Twitter Tuesday episode of Lockdown Vikings podcast. But if you want something more in depth, a little more patient, a little more nuanced, you can find patreon.com slash NFL. Join that for the real premium stuff where I actually can break down film and show you kind of what I'm talking about sometimes and hopefully learn a thing or two in the process. Next one comes from Vikings129 who asks... I don't think either KOC or Kwesi is on the hot seat currently, but do you think either or both of their seats are getting a little warm? Um, I'm starting to hear this question a little more, right? Um, short answer is probably not in any substantive sense. Uh, with Kwesi, almost certainly not. For me, at least. And it, like, if I were in charge, I wouldn't touch it for three years. Would just would let it play out. If you could be the worst dude ever, and I know I'm wasting more time on that, but you got to let these things kind of develop and 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 become realized versions of themselves, right? Don't quit the rebuild halfway through the rebuild just to start a different rebuild with different guys. That's how you become, you know, the Browns in 2017 and 2016 going one and 31 over two years. That's how you create the worst, you know, teams that are so bad they go down in inf infamy and become a black mark on your legacy, your organization's legacy. Um you got to let things kind of play out a little bit, especially with a GM. Like a lot of people want to judge Quasi over the first two draft picks that he ever made and kind of forget the rest and say, ah, no, nah, he's bad. Um, I think that's just ridiculously unfair. Uh, the, in terms of head coach, I think it, it I, I, there have been moments where, yeah, now it's right to like urban Meyer, right? It's like right to fire that guy after a year. If they're just such a crazy bad catastrophe, but it has to be like really, really extreme for me to think ah, two years and we're out of here. Um, I have critiques of O'Connell and you can have like problems with like, Hey, pointing out this should be better. That should be better. This is an issue that I have, but I don't think we have to take the next step which is to add on, you know, and therefore I think we should go get a new head coach. It's like, just no, this is a problem that I think you should just go try to fix. But I think problem solving has to be the attitude, not guy replacing, <laughs> which is what I talk about all the time, right? If everything, you, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, in terms of what's going on inside the actual org, I'd be very surprised if either of those guys were on any kind of hot seat, but I'm not a guy with sources. So you, you might have to look elsewhere. Uh, theorist asks, how quickly would you expect O'Connell and the team to fix their situational ability? Is this a week to week thing or just be hoping that they show up next year with stronger heads on their shoulders? I think it can be a week to week thing. I, I don't think there's anything preventing them from just being better about that on Sundays. Doesn't cost any cap space to get your, your, plays incorrectly, right? Doesn't cost any draft picks to be smarter about, uh, you know, throwing toward the sideline or not in a two minute drill. Um, there, there is no, you, you, that's not a matter of talent, right? That's not a matter of athleticism. It's just a matter of, of keeping your head on, right? Yeah. Keeping a, a tighter head on your shoulder. What'd you say? A, a stronger head on your shoulders. Yeah. I think that's a great way to put it. I think it's 
particularly annoying that Mr. Situational Masters is the one having these issues. It's like my key problem with O'Connell right now is like, this is your whole thing, dude. Like, this has to be better. Uh, but again, it is the kind of thing that they could just show up and do a really good job of next week. And then maybe the issue is behind us and we never have to talk about it again. King Squeak says, has any team had their entire starting skill position group lose a fumble in a season? And who needs to fumble for the Vikings to do it this year? So I'm sure that at, at some point, especially pre like 1970, teams would fumble like 55 times a year. Fumbles were ridiculously common back in the day. Um, so I'm sure that that there have been games where every wide receiver, every running back or whatever had a fumble. Um, for the Vikings to do it, uh, the closest I believe is wide receivers. You have a um, Justin Jefferson has a fumble. Uh, Jordan Addison does not. I believe KJ Osborne has a fumble, or I guess that was like an interception uh, technically, but it was I don't know, on him. So count that how you want to count that. And then you have Brandon Powell. Jalen Naylor's got to get healthy and do it. Powell has one as a punt returner. Um, oh, no, I guess uh, tight end, because now you have a Josh Oliver. We have a TJ Hawkinson one that was like a catch and then a fumble, right? That one didn't count as an interception. And then all you need is a Johnny Munt. So let's get those those uh, keeper slides going. Uh, next one comes from Hank Lee, who says, it feels apparent that this is the last year with Kirk. Considering all the dead money with his void years, how hamstrung will the Vikings be in building the roster the next three years? The next three years? Uh, no, that's the, not at all. That's not the time frame. The, the Kirk thing will affect the next year. And if they want, they can spread it over two. Uh, but that would be something they do because they like think that that's better than taking it all in one year. So Kirk Cousins currently will cost, in February, whatever date that is that he his contract voids, uh, it'll be March 15th. Okay, so not February. March 15th, 2024, his contract will void. That means that his uh, he will be released, he becomes a free agent, and he will carry a dead cap hit on the Vikings books of $28.5 million. Once that $28.5 is paid off, we're out of it. That's it. Kirk Cousins is in the past. Um, including that $25 million, the Vikings are currently projected to be top half of the league in cap space with $55 mil in cap space, uh, $38 mil in quote-unquote effective cap space, which it includes like draft class and stuff like that. So, but that's plenty, right? They've got lots of cap space going into the 2024 season. And that is including the uh, Kirk Cousins thing. That's also including probably the max that Justin Jefferson will cost against that. Um, if they get another contract done, really uh, common move would be to have a signing bonus on that, which will move his 2024 cap hit down uh, in you know, he'll, he'll cost way more in future years, but that's because we're signing a new contract, of course. Um, but either way, 19 mil already earmarked for that. So like a lot of the big, ex and that's like TJ Hawkinson, like all the big expenses are already taken care of. The only one I would guess is Derisaw, and that would probably be a contract signed that doesn't kick into any real money until the future. So the Vikings have lots of cap space with Kirk, uh, with even with all this. If they really choose that they want to say split that 22 mil in half uh, or that 28.5 mil in half. Um, they can basically assuming Kirk cousins wants to play ball with this, which there's no real reason for him not to except for like spite, I guess um, they can sign Kirk cousins to a fake contract and then immediately cut him with a post June 1st designation everywhere. I have looked, I've not found a reason that this is against the rules, but please tell me if it is actually against the rules. It just is a cheeky trick that feels like it's possible. Um, but basically that's, uh, accounting cat magic that takes the 28.5 and let's say you sign him to a two year deal with no guarantees on it for whatever amount of money that doesn't matter cause you're cutting it, which prevents the contract from voiding out in the same way. It actually takes 18.25 of that 28 million and moves it into 2025. So you take 10 mil now and 18 mil next year if you want to split up, split up the pain a little bit. It's not a necessary move. They can pay it all off at once, but they can also do it in installments. You can kind of think of that as if you really had to. So how hamstrung are they? Not very much at all. Uh, the Vikings, Kwesi has absolutely like sacrificed the roster to balance the books. For those of you who wanted the Vikings to be like, to get out of this cap hell and like get their cap under control and be responsible spenders, congratulations. They've done it. Now the defensive roster sucks, but they've done it. <laughs> I don't know if that was worth it. I don't really think it was, but you got what you wanted if you disagree with me. Um, got a few more questions to get through, so we will 
uh, fly through them coming up. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you play, place a $5 bet. That means you can throw down any $5 bet you want from a Justin Jefferson t- or a TJ Hawkinson, I guess, touchdown bet to Kirk Cousins over passing yards, spreads, lines, uh, over-unders, um, whatever you want. You can parlay a whole bunch of stuff together if you want to. Put down that $5 bet. And if you go to fanduel.com slash locked on to do that, you will get $200 in bonus bets back just for placing the bet. Doesn't matter if you win or lose. Just for placing the bet, you get 200 bucks. There is no better time to join FanDuel and take advantage of their super easy to use app and the fact that they pay out instantly when you win. Once again, go to fanduel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Wrapping up this Twitter Tuesday episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast, the next one comes from Shadow Flame, who says, Am I wrong in thinking either the Vikings make a miracle comeback and sneak into the playoffs hot, or have a good situation on drafting a future franchise quarterback? Uh, I, I don't think you're wrong. No, I'm, I will find out, right? <laughs> I'll ask me in February, then we'll know if you were wrong or not, right? But uh, I think anything's possible here, right? Look, are they going to make the playoffs and like make a really cool run? History says it isn't probable, but it ain't impossible, right? <laughs> it's like the, the 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 Pirates of the Caribbean thing. It's like, ah, it's not possible. No, it's not probable. If you look at the schedule coming up, and if you really want to do the strength of schedule thing, oh, you know, they get a game against the Bears, and, and the Packers don't look good right now, and you get the Raiders and the Broncos, and ah, you can start to add up wins and start to do the math and see, maybe see a path to getting back toward 500 and maybe sneaking into a wild card or something like that. Maybe the Lions have a, an epic collapse or something like that, and the Vikings get hot at the Like, who knows, right? That's why we watch this season. Um, maybe they don't, maybe they totally fall apart and they end up with a three win season and they have a top five pick. And then, then we start, we're talking about QBs by November. Uh, maybe neither of those things happen and they continue to be kind of up and down and they end up kind of like 2021, they end up with seven or eight wins and in the middle of the pack and they have to trade up. Um, what position they're in to get a quarterback is something that we'll talk about when we know what position they're in to get a quarterback. But if they were as willing as they were to move up from 23, if they're at like 13 or 12 or whatever, and they're just as motivated, there should be a deal somewhere that they can find. I guess, I guess that I would hope. Uh, relevant to that, Phoenix is a Viking. Asks, how long is it going to take you to come around to Michael Phoenix Jr. being a Viking? <laughs> um, on brand question. Uh, I will not watch, uh, seriously watch college quarterbacks until like February or March. So if you want to know the timeline, that's the timeline. I'll, I'll probably, I mean, I'll probably jump right into it. That'll be the first thing I do in in draft season. But for me, draft season starts kind of after free agency chills out a little bit. So like mid March is when you can sort of expect actual quarterback thoughts from me. Nate Walton asks season ends somewhere between 10 and seven and eight and nine and eight and nine Kirk walks. Luke, if you were our GM, would you burn her first or second on Justin Fields or just trust the draft and KLC to develop a QB? Justin Fields, I don't think I don't think I would put a first or second into Justin Fields. I don't think I'm giving the Bears, especially in the division, I'm not giving them that get out of jail free card in the situation that they put themselves in. They drafted Justin Fields, they traded two first round picks to get him, and then they absolutely categorically botched his development. Like, they, I mean, that is a catastrophe that Bears fans are probably going to complain about, rightfully so, for decades. And I don't think I'm exaggerating. Um, and, unless Justin Fields finds a way to, like, come around despite not really having the same talent. Like, they're going to have to have a hell of an offseason, right? But in the world where the Bears are offloading Justin Fields, if they're willing to give up on him, I'm not going to throw them a lifeline. Uh, it's going to be more like Trey Lance, where it's a mid-round pick. And would I spend a a mid-round pick on Justin Fields as a reclamation project? It's a much easier sell for me. Uh, But I wouldn't feel satisfied if, like, that were our plan at QB. I think he's just too broken. I think the Bears have ruined his development, and he has solidified too many bad habits where he has to be viewed as a multi-year project that is only allowed to succeed because this is a fresh start. Uh, And if that's the package that I'm buying... I can absolutely, I feel like I can do better with a first round pick, even not the highest first round pick. I'd much rather grab one of these like Pac-12 quarterbacks that maybe isn't as uh, highly regarded, but I would absolutely take that 
with my first round pick if I were gonna if I'm saying I'm using my first round pick on a quarterback, which hey, maybe you should. But as a reclamation project, as a roll of the dice, as kind of a random guy, let's see if he develops. Throw a mid round pick at that. Yeah, I could be talked into it. Um Chris asks, including the initial broadcast, how much time do you spend watching the most recent game over the course of a single week? Whoo, that's a good one. Uh so including the recent the broadcast, that's three hours, right? Or three and a half, we'll say. I probably spend about the same amount of time watching tape once the tape comes out. Um, cause I, I like to scrub through and I like to watch it over and over again. And then I'm, I'm setting aside clips for Patreon and then I'm doing clips for Twitter and it takes me a while to kind of go through it. So three and a half, four hours, just watching the tape. And then I actually start making and editing the content, which I don't think counts for this it's more of, of like production time. Uh, so like that much, so probably, yeah, seven, eight hours a week, just sitting and like watching, uh, and then more, if you count the scouting videos I've been doing on my Patreon, which is where now I'm pulling up Chiefs tape and, you know, I'll probably pull up Bears. I don't think I'm going to pull up Bears tape. Actually, I don't think I'm going to do a scouting one this week. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like more if you count that stuff and then, you know, I'll, I'll go back and people will ask a question and then I'll go back and look at the tape for the answer and stuff. So that'll kind of add up. So yeah, 10 hours. Let's call it 10 hours. Mario asks, does history indicate any pattern that works most often when it comes to team building, i.e. making it to the playoffs and winning a Super Bowl? Uh, and this question went on for a lot longer, but I, I get what you're getting at. Um, there are certain trends that you can go for. Like, you know, it it makes a lot of, it doesn't make a lot of sense to pay a running back a lot of money. Historically, that has like not led to the effects that you're looking for. Or... Um, it's better to trade down in the draft, that kind of thing, because more bites at the apple tends to be better than, uh, you know, one really high value bite at the apple, just historically. Um, there's, so there's, there's like stuff like that. But if you're talking about like wholesale strategy, I don't think that we have um, stable enough samples to answer that question, I guess. But what I'll say is, this is probably deeply unsatisfying, so I apologize. Uh, you got to be right. Got to be right about your quarterback. That's the biggest one. Be right when you get your quarterback. How you get your quarterback can go a whole bunch of different ways. It can be Jalen Hurts in the second round. It can be uh, Lamar Jackson at the end of the first round. It can be a top five, you know, Joe Burrow quarterback, you know, Tua or even Justin Herbert. Like it can be that. But for every Justin Herbert, you get a Daniel Jones. So you got to be right. Um, and actually, maybe that's the, the best thing, right? You have a bad season, you end up drafting sixth overall, and you get your quarterback. That does not, that is not guaranteed to work. Uh, but you gotta be right, right? You, you gotta hit on Justin Herbert, and you gotta avoid your Daniel Jones. Um, and if you're wrong about Daniel Jones, and then you double down on him by signing him to a big contract, then you like extra messed up, right? Uh, be correct. It's easier said than done, right? But if we're talking about what is the pattern that works most often, it's when you're right in the draft. Uh, and, and, and if you have a monster draft, like 2017 Saints or the famous uh, Seahawks drafts of like 2012 and 2013, um, the, I think the Titans had one a couple years ago that has sort of propelled them despite maybe not necessarily getting what they want out of Ryan Tannehill, right? Uh, 2015 Vikings draft propelled an, a whole era of the Vikings in Hunter, Kendrick, Stefan Diggs, like all of that. Anthony Harris was a, was an undrafted free agent too. Like that you, if you slam dunk home run a draft that creates opportunities to, to f find greatness, but it's ultimately be right about the quarterback. And that's kind of it. Um, that is probably way too much time. I probably have to cut a whole bunch of these, so I'm sorry if your question got cut, but, uh, feel free to re-ask it next week. If you want, you can find me, of course, locked on Vikings on Twitter, Luke Braun NFL on Twitter, uh, locked on Vikings podcast at gmail.com and, uh, Google form in the show notes, YouTube comments, all of that. I'll see you all tomorrow. I'll hopefully have some more substantive things to say about defense. That's what I'm, I'm angling to, to get good at. So we'll find that. And as always, skull.